Let me ask you, do you believe that this morning, that there is nothing more powerful than the blood of Jesus Christ? Do you believe that? Let me ask you this. Are you thankful this morning? Are you grateful? Okay, it's very important. One of the most important biblical concepts is this idea of thanksgiving tied to worship. You cannot worship him properly unless you are thankful foundational, key. In fact, Psalm 50 says that, that do you know what God requires of you? Do you know of, of, of all the things that, that we do with worship? Do you know the one thing that he genuinely wants? He, he says two things in Psalm 50. He says, I want to be your rescuer, and I just want you to have a thankful heart. In fact, in, in Romans 1, what we see, the charge against all of unbelieving society is and they do not give thanks. So this morning, we're going to ask that question. Are we thankful? And I want you to take inventory. I want you to ask genuine pressing questions of yourself, okay? Would your spouse say that you are thankful? Would your kids say? Would your friends, would your coworkers, would they say that based on what comes out of your mouth? So turn with me, if you will, to uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 18 this morning. All right, so I just have to be honest. As we're asking this question of thanksgiving, all right, does anyone else find it difficult that you are becoming cynical along with the world around us? Okay, like it's harder and harder not to grumble every time you turn on the news. Okay, all the political posturing that occurs over every news story, all right? Whose laptop, who beat who with a hammer, stolen elections, democracy is under attack, all of this, right? We, we live in a world of scoffers. Whoever can yell the loudest and mock the most gets clicks and views and in some way, that scoffing has affected all of us. Add to that the unrest of our culture, school shooting after school shooting, riots, defund the police, and our confused mental state. And I find myself growing in cynicism. Am I alone? And so, beloved, the question we must ask this morning is, are we, as Christians, as the church, are we any different than the outside world? I've got to share a story with you that a pastor friend of mine sent me. Uh, you will not believe that it's actually real. Okay, he, he had a, a 10 plus year member of his church that he had led to Christ, that he had discipled, okay? A single mom of two that they had invested hundreds of personal hours okay, and attention. In fact, thousands of dollars after her husband uh, lost his job and went to prison for an online gambling scheme, okay? This member, this woman, withdrew her membership from their church because, I quote, nobody in the church likes or comments on my Facebook post anymore. Now, of all the things that you could think about that story, the reality is, is there is a, a thread of, of just being ungrateful. Beloved, our passage today is going to tie, okay, our witness, how bright our light shines into darkness and its ability to be diminished over grumbling and 
complaining, a lack of thanksgiving. I've titled the sermon this morning, How to Be Unthankful. In case you were wondering, like, like how can I get more unthankful than, than you could follow this instruction here today? So let's listen as we read Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you will appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering, that's Paul writing, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice uh, and service of your faith, I rejoice and I share my joy with you all. So you too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, as we have been reminded of the blood of Christ that you have sacrificed yourself, your son, for us, for our sins, so that we could know you and so that we could walk with you. And your word says so that we will have life and have it abundantly. Father, we welcome your spirit to convict our hearts, to remind us about how we go throughout everyday life and whether we are genuinely thankful or whether we grumble and complain. We welcome that conviction because, Father, you call us to life. And you want what is best for us. And so help us to take honest assessment of that this morning, as difficult as that may be. You are the lifter of our heads. We believe that and we trust that this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so let me remind you of the context of the book of Philippians, because it's absolutely one of my favorite uh, uh, epistle backgrounds and, and context, okay? Uh, and, and even more so, so that you know that when Paul writes these words, this isn't empty preacher talk, okay? Us, us preachers can be a, a, a bit uh, exaggerated from time to time. But what you need to understand about Paul here, all right? Paul is writing in, the, in Rome. And Rome is a perversely sinful city. Okay, cruel forms of slavery are a common practice. Unwanted infants die by exposure. And the sexual morals of the court of the culture were lewd. Caesar was worshipped as a god, along with a multitude of deities. And their worship was, was ingrained in the culture. It's what everyone did, and it became essential for national pride. All right, are you for Rome? Well, then you need to be for this. And one's economic standing was also tied to it. So Christians who refused to worship Caesar or or any pagan deities, they were often ostracized and at times heavily persecuted. Paul writes in a Roman jail cell. He does not know if he will live or die at the end of his trial. And along the way, he has suffered greatly for the gospel. He writes, he tells us that he has been beaten so many times that he's lost count. And one time, he was stoned. Do you know when they stop stoning you? When they think you're dead. His body aches with every movement as he lies on a cold prison floor. If his physical suffering wasn't enough, accusations arise from the church that there are those leaders within the churches uh, that dislike him and are using his circumstances as a chance to malign his character. 
physical attacks, personal attacks, all in a sinful society. So listen up because he has earned our ear whenever he writes, do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourself to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom, right, we are to appear as lights in the world. Now, Paul knows quite well Okay, of the world around us falling to pieces. He simply says that grumbling and arguing is what makes you like the world. And the world has an endless supply of strife, doesn't it? But if the culture of the church And the culture of our homes and the culture of our friendships and the culture of what constantly comes out of your mouth is the same, then we have no light. Instead, guys, we are called to rejoice, be thankful. That's the theme of Philippians, and as doing so, you will appear as lights in the darkness around us. So we've been talking a lot about witness as we walk through the book of Acts, right? Remember, you, you'll have power when the Spirit comes upon you, and you are to be my witnesses. So we've been talking a ton about being a witness, and and what I want us to see this morning is this is going to be practical application, all right? One of the most practical, uh, applicable sermons, and that is our witness is tied to our thanksgiving, especially amidst a crooked and perverse generation. Now, before we go any further, it's very important that we ask, what sort of grumbling and complaining does this context have in mind to warn Christians about? Okay, and this is really important because it's important to understand that this does not mean keep the peace at the cost of truth. Okay, right, just, just zip it, don't say anything, we can't say anything, just, just keep the peace at all costs, that's not what's going on here. So, so we have to understand, what sort of grumbling and complaining can we have that is going to diminish our light? And the context helps us figure that out. So here we go, the immediate context. The argument begins in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 where he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Okay? And then verses five through eight, he tells us, we are to be like Jesus. Then he reminds us that Jesus, you know, Jesus did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. He was equal with God, but he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but rather he humbled himself by becoming a man. But on top of that, how did he behave amongst men? He humbled himself amongst us, even to the point of death on a cross. So contextually here, the grumbling and complaining that that is first addressed amongst us is that associated with the pride of comparison. The strife that accompanies constantly competing for the superiority of life. Hey, I'm doing good because I'm ahead of the next guy. More clever, better looking, more important. And my value is in, well, I'm better than her and him. And if I have to chop others down just a little bit along the way in order for me to achieve my superior, that's fine. Now, can you imagine how 
toxic a Christian culture can be when that sort of attitude runs rampant and not one of humility? I mean, you talk about grumbling and complaining. Here's a perfect example, a perfect picture of it. Do you remember in the Gospels, Jesus, the the last spot he stops is in Jericho, and then he's making his way towards Jerusalem. And he turns to his disciples and he's telling them, we're headed to Jerusalem and I'm about to die on the cross. And while they're walking, while they're making that journey, there's fussing and fighting amongst the disciples. They are arguing over who's going to get the seats of priority whenever Jesus comes in his kingdom. And in fact, James and John have their mom go and ask Jesus for the seats of priority, and that sets everyone off, right? And then Jesus says, guys, listen. That's the way the world works. But in God's economy... We are not like that. The greatest in the kingdom are servants. The greatest are servants. That's the way God's economy works. Laying down your rights for others, that's leadership. Now let's be honest, in a culture that we live in that markets towards consumer image and competitive pride. Our whole economy, every advertisement angle is thrown at you. Do you find that your life is filled with bitterness and cynicism because the Joneses have a bigger house than you? Or your life is driven by, I'll get my respect. I'll show them that I'm somebody. Beloved, that leads to strife and discontentment in your life. And that is just like the world. But Jesus has come to set us free. And I pray that our culture right here within this church is one of humility, is one of servanthood, not one-upmanship, because then our light shines bright to a lost community. Now, secondly, when you work through the text and, and you're asking contextually, what is the grumbling and complaining that we are to be mindful of here? We're supposed to think of Israel wandering in the wilderness and the grumbling and complaining that took place there because he uses a phrase here, perverse and crooked generation. Now that's a quotation of Deuteronomy 32.5 where Moses gave that generation that title. So Paul means for us to learn from their grumbling and complaining that they are a picture of unthankfulness. So in your mind, think about that that generation that came out of Egypt and the way that they were filled with grumbling and complaining. So let's ask this question. Do you find yourself complaining about your circumstances rather than praying? I say that, do you find that you complain about your circumstances or do you pray? In Numbers 11, uh, verses one through six, Israel, the, Israel, uh, the Israelites, they gl- greatly desired meat. Okay, they greatly desired meat. And God had miraculously provided for them manna, but they had to wake up every day to that same old manna. Right? They had to pick up that miracle bread off the ground every day, and they were tired of that. And so they said, God, we, we want meat. You see, their heart is filled with unthankfulness. Right? They are not grateful for God's provision. Rather, their mouth is filled with complaint. How quickly they have forgotten all that the Lord has done. And instead, they have become expectant. I deserve better. 
Come on. What is this manna? I deserve meat. Now, listen, even if their desire for meat is a good thing, the question is, is what did they do with it? Did they give that desire to God in prayer or complain? Well, no, they complain. Right? It makes me think of Veruca Salt in the movie Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Now, in no way am I endorsing the Johnny Depp version. You need to go back and watch the Gene Wilder version. But there's, a, there's particular dialogue with Veruca Salt where she says, Daddy, I want a squirrel. Give me one of those squirrels. I want one. And her dad says, Veronica, dear, you have many marvelous pets. And she says, well, all I've got at home is one pony and two dogs and four cats and six bunny rabbits and two parakeets and three canaries and a green parrot and a turtle and a silly old hamster. I want a squirrel. You see, it's easy for us to spot an entitled attitude whenever it is in others. But what about in ourselves? What would your family say comes out of your mouth more? Is it thankfulness for God's provision? Or is it complaining for what you lack? And when you can't shake it, when you realize that it's a real need, what do you do with it? Do you pray and do you leave it at your heavenly Father's feet? Or do you grumble to anyone who will listen? Did you know that it was supposed to take Israel 11 days after they left Mount Sinai to enter into the promised land? 11 days through the wilderness. Yes, it would be difficult, but, but God was going to be their sustainer and they were to trust him. Instead, what do they do? How do they respond to this trial? They repeatedly said, let's go back to Egypt where we had it so good. And they also blame Moses. But God had brought them out into the wilderness. Even as a trial, he would say, so that they would learn to trust him before giving them the goodness of the promised land. It was God's doing that they were going through the valley before they got to the mountaintop on the other side. But when things got difficult, complainers need someone to blame. It's Moses' fault. You know, if we had real leadership, everything would be all right. Hey, let's go back to Egypt where we had it so good. Cucumbers and melons and garlic and onions. But now all we have is this stinking old manna. You mean back to slavery? Back to slavery, where you own no land, where you, where you worked your fingers to the bone, where you, you did not know if you were going to make it through the day. You see, guys, if we're honest, there is this idol of the past known as nostalgia that causes men and women to grumble and complain. The reason is, I want you to think well about this, is because everything in the past is fixed, there is no uncertainty. And when you look towards the future, there's, there's uncertainty, there's fear, right? There can be no fear in the past because it's all fixed. So instead of relying upon God, instead of trusting that his grace is sufficient for the trial that is ahead, instead of saying God's promises are good, they are waiting us on the other side, instead Israel complains and turns an 11-day trial through the wilderness into 40 years. Some of you lack a spiritual depth, and you're stuck spiritually because your only response to trials is to complain. 
You blame your parents. You blame your boss. You blame somebody, anybody. Heck, blame the president. And watch endless news cycles that sell fear and insecurity. Beloved, that's unhealthy. It's unhealthy. At a previous church, there was a Bible study that I was invited to, and I went and I joined, and I started going early in the mornings, excited to listen and read and talk about God's word together and pray for each other. And do you know how quickly it just turned into a gripe fest on politics? And we were so far from God's word and God's promises. Let me also say this, I mean this, for your good, for your edification. It is equally unhealthy to long for the past. Not that you can't look fondly towards the past. Beloved, Jesus awaits you. The promised land is ahead of you. And if all you do is long to go backwards, it's unhealthy. A grumpy Christian is an oxymoron. Should not be that way. We lose our witness when we grumble like Israel did. Because when trials hit, guys, we trust God. Has he given his son for us? Then we can trust him. That he is in the process of bringing us through the valley in order to get us to his promises. That you and I have an unshakable kingdom. Isn't that what Hebrews 12 says? Therefore, since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for God is a consuming fire. Guys, you and I can be thankful because our kingdom is not shaken. Yes, we live in a shaken world, but you and I have been promised an unshakable kingdom. Church, what happens whenever you think about how much your finger hurts? It hurts more. How's your toothache? Well, worse now that you asked. How's your headache? Well, now it's unbearable. What happens when you surround yourself by others who grumble and complain? You do it too. We have soon become a culture of grumbling and complaining. It's in vogue. What can you whine about? Young people have a one-upmanship on complaining. Well, you don't struggle the way that I struggle. But church, what the Bible is saying here is that if you prove in your life to be unthankful, a grumbler and a complainer, you prove to be a part of the crooked and perverse generation that died in the wilderness. Not saved. Beloved, the mark of being a Christian is that you lead your thought life back to being thankful away from grumbling and complaining. A Christian chooses to be thankful and full of grace, light in darkness, no matter the circumstances. To not focus on grumbling and complaining. Preacher, are you advocating positive thinking? Well, if you mean by positive thinking that Saturday Night Live skit with Stuart Smalley where he stared in the mirror and said, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Well, no, that's not the positive thinking I'm advocating. But if by positive thinking you mean remembering the biblical promises that God has given us, remembering that God is good and he has promised to take all things and to work them together for our good, giving us the ability to rejoice even in the midst of trials, well, yes, that's what I'm advocating so what does that look like? With our short bit of time left, 
Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 103. Psalm 103, because I couldn't preach an entire sermon where all I did is grumble and complain. Look at the first five verses of Psalm 103. We sang this this morning. It is good for our soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. I want us to notice how David is commanding his soul to praise God. Right? He is prompting, stirring himself up, preaching to himself. Wake up, soul, wake up. Is the fire dying down? Then kindle it afresh. All that is within me, right? Don't go through another day with, with just lip service to God pretending to be close, with our heart not engaged. You say, how can David command that his soul praise God? Doesn't that just come? Well, no. He says and reminds himself, forget none of his benefits. That God has promises, that God has a benefit package. And the truth be told is that you and I tend to forget all the goodness and all that God has done for us and all that God has promised. We tend to forget. One Thanksgiving when I was growing up, uh, we were all at my grandfather's house. My grandfather was a World War II veteran, lived through the Great Depression turn the corner after the meal and find him hand-washing paper plates. My grandfather had plenty of money, but he's hand-washing paper plates. I was like, Grandpa, like we, we eat on those so that you can throw them away. But one thing you noticed about him is he, he didn't forget where he came from. Beloved, we cannot be like the the lepers in, in Luke 17, where 10 of them were healed, but only one came back to say thank you to Jesus. Who pardons all your iniquities? Jesus took all of our shame, in the midst of our rebellion, he paid the ransom price, nailing our certificate of debt to the cross and marking on it, paid in full. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought that my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Who heals all of your diseases? Have you paused to think that in the course of your life, how many illnesses that your body has fought off? Bless the Lord. How many cuts and bruises and broken bones that your body has healed from on its own? Bless the Lord. How many times you have prayed about something that showed signs of being serious and it was right there and you were fearful and then the test came back with good results? Bless the Lord. And I know that all across this room you ask, well, what about my loved one who hasn't been healed? And it is with deepest sympathy that I remind you that they received Jesus Christ himself. Verse four, who redeems your life from the pit. 
I shudder to think where I would be right now if it weren't for Jesus. If the Holy Spirit of God didn't come and awaken my heart and my soul to the truth, if, if someone didn't come and invite me and preach the gospel, if I didn't hear, where would I be? Because he has redeemed my life. Finally, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Is the love of God like the love of a junior high relationship? Have I told you before I once had a uh, girlfriend in fifth grade that it lasted one day? At the beginning of that day, uh, I sent a note that said, would you be my girlfriend? Check yes or no. And I was very pleased to receive that letter back and she had checked yes. And then all the, the, the talk throughout the entire day, we were on a field trip. And in fact, I didn't see her that entire day. But, but there were lots of conversations. It was all the talk of fifth grade. But then by the time we got on the bus at the end of the day, I received another note from one of her friends that says she would just like to be friends right now, okay? And so that was that. Is the love of God like that? Is he that fickle? From eternity past, he knew you and he chose you in his son. He knew that you would be here this day. He knew it all. His son died for you while you were his enemy. That's what Romans 5 says. That means you were fighting against him when he died and then the spirit of God came and opened your eyes and began to woo your heart. Is the love of God fickle? He crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Forget none of all that he has done for me. Has he not overwhelmed you with wave after wave after wave? And what does he require of us, beloved? That we would be thankful. Many of you know the story of Corey Ten Boom through her famous book, The Hiding Place. It's an incredible story there uh, in the midst of that on Thanksgiving. The barracks that Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy uh, were kept in in the Nazi concentration camp was called Ravensbrück. And those barracks were terribly overwhelmed they were overcrowded and they were flea infested. Now, miraculously, in those barracks, they were able to smuggle a Bible into the camp. And they would meet together in secret, and, and they as they read the Bible, they read that you are that that we are to give thanks in all things, and that God can use anything for good. So Betsy, Corey's sister, decided that this meant that they needed to thank God for the fleas. Now, this was entirely too much for Corey. She's like, absolutely, we're not going to do that. There is no such thing. I'm not thanking God for these awful fleas. But Betsy insisted. So eventually, Corey gave in, and they prayed to God and thanked him even for the fleas. Over the next several months, a wonderful but curious thing happened. They found that none of the guards entered into their barracks. This meant that none of the women were assaulted, but it also meant that they could do the unthinkable, which was hold an open Bible study and prayer meetings right in the heart of a Nazi concentration camp. And through this, countless numbers of women came to faith in Jesus Christ. And it was only at the end did they discover why the guards had left them alone and would not enter into their barracks. It was because of those fleas. So this Thanksgiving, 
as we close in prayer, as we pause to think about all that God has done, as we lead our hearts to thanksgiving, we remember our light, our witness to an outside culture and community is based on our we thankful people and the praise that comes out of our mouth. Do we lead our heart and our soul or do we forget his benefits and grumble and complain? Let us not. Let's bless the Lord. Let's lead our hearts and our souls to remember all that he has done. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, for his finished work on the cross, for all that you have done. The fact that you have chosen us and you call us your own from eternity past. The fact that we are yours, that we come in here distracted and, and, and sinful from the week and that we come in here and, and we're worried about what, what the Joneses have and whether we're good enough and all of that grumbling and complaining. All of that, God, and we, we need to fix our eyes on you. And so right now we fix our eyes on you and we declare to you, God, help us through the power of your spirit because of the proclamation of the gospel and the good news of Jesus. Help us to be thankful and to lead our mind into your goodness and what you've done. Help us to abide in you with thanksgiving, even to make requests to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Beloved, as the choir comes and, or, or the praise team comes and leads us in a final song, you and I are invited to respond. Whatever form or fashion you feel that the Holy Spirit has placed upon your heart. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. Whatever the burden of your heart, you're not alone. If you realize through the proclamation of God's word this morning that you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, come. Today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. We had a young lady last week who said, I had spent so much time playing church. And I realized others speak about Jesus in a different way than I do. I don't know that I've really met him. If that's you, come have no greater joy and delight than to share with you how you can come to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Whatever decision you need to make, you be obedient to the Spirit's prompting.